County. This is Cheryl Rose at the Clifton County Museum. And we're out here this morning. Uh, we're going to take a little walk. But first, I'd like to introduce my um, partners in this walk. This is Barry Foster. She is the museum director. And behind the camera is our able camerawoman, Sherry Honorati. We're going to see what all we can see. We're going to listen for bird song, and if we're lucky, maybe we'll see a snake or a, a turtle or something. This is a half mile loop trail. So let's get started. You have to be careful, don't you, Cheryl, on the trail because of all of the uh, rainwater that washes the gravel. Right, we have some washouts. There's also lots of sweet gum balls on the uh, on the path, and that's kind of like walking on marbles. So you want to be careful. You don't want to step onto something or step into a hole. There are um, uh, armadillos out here, and occasionally they'll dig a hole. Now, aren't those more nocturnal, or do we see them during the day? You can see them during the day, but they are more nocturnal. I was going to say, I don't think I've ever seen them during the day, but I know I've seen them at dusk here sometimes in the winter when we leave and it's right. getting dark. I've seen them then. And it's early morning here. The birds are still singing. The shadows are long. Unfortunately, since we didn't get to take this walk in the spring, we missed a lot of the spring bloom. But there's still lots of interesting things to, uh, to see and lots of interesting trees like this honey locust we're having to duck under. Be aware of, uh, this is, poison, uh, this is um, Virginia creeper on the side, leaves of five, let it thrive. But there is a lot of poison ivy out here. Uh, you just don't want to touch anything that you don't recognize. And we're coming up now on a bridge that was built for us uh, as an Eagle Scout project. And Barry, who was that that built this? Stephen Scott. And he... Uh He's local Tipton County Eagle Scout, and uh, he he went on to the University of Memphis. He was going to be studying, I believe, engineering, but he designed this himself, and his uh, fellow Eagle Scouts helped him build it. And it was something actually we didn't even really realize we needed, um, but he loved coming out here and noticed that this spot in the nature trail was very low and was often wet and he thought oh they you know built a bridge and so he did and we're very grateful to him very very sturdy the nice thing about the eagle scout projects is um most of them not all of them but most of them are able to raise the funds themselves um, which is very helpful to us because we don't have a, a line item in our budget for that Right. But it's beautiful. He did that about, Sherry, it was shortly after you came, right? Yeah, so about three years. Three years, give or take. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it's still just as strong as ever. And it's very nice, and it makes a great place to take photos, too. I've taken a lot of photos of, of people here. Um, you're hearing that bird song? That's a northern cardinal. There's, there he goes. And somebody's answering him. So they're talking this morning to each other. By the way, if you're interested in bird watching, this is a perfect place to do it. We're right in the middle of Covington, but you wouldn't know it when you get up in here. Bring some binoculars, bring a bird ID book for Birds of Tennessee, and just come and explore. We stopped right here because I would like to show you uh, a tree that's very uh, recognizable here along the trail. And that is the American Beach. That's one right out there. You see where school kids have carved their names and their initials in it. 
and the reason they do that is uh, American Beach has a very smooth bark so it's very easy to carve into it unfortunately it's not good for the tree and uh, this one has pretty much healed over thank goodness and now it's protected since it's out here but um, that is the American Beach and I actually have some of the leaves here that is an American Beach leaf that's from last fall um, very distinctive oval shape and it has little teeth and scalloped edges you've drawn that in your I, sketchbook I, I, I have, I've, I've seen that uh, that was that was the first um, thing I tried to draw when I started uh, doing nature journaling and so I've, I recognize American Beach leaves uh, very easily they're beautiful and that tree looks like it's fairly old and I notice up on the top um, there's like a section that maybe lightning like a whole section came down but the tree seems to be thriving Yes, and that one's, uh, I have no idea how old it is, but that's a, a very mature tree. One thing that I found interesting is this trail was established before the museum was established. Yes. And um, there's a sign out at the wetlands that we're going to come up to in a little while that talks about that. So, um, it was here first. The museum opened its doors on Veterans Day in 1998, although the building was finished the year before but this was already here even prior something I want to point out to folks since we were talking about Virginia creeper and poison ivy and it's not just small you can get uh, some very large poison ivy plants and if, if you notice what looks like kind of like rope on the trunk of that tulip poplar it's kind of fuzzy. That is some poison ivy. Very large poison ivy vines. But if you see a vine on a tree and it looks fuzzy like that, sort of looks like old rope, you want to stay away from it. Now, what's the difference? I know that grapevine, and I'm from Virginia, and, and I remember going through the forests in Virginia, there was a lot of grapevine mm -hmm. and people would, um, I guess, harvest it and make grapevine wreaths. Mm -hmm. So how do I know we'll, that's not grapevine or do we have grapevine here? We have a lot of grapevine in here and we'll come upon some soon. Um, the easy way to tell is grapevine is going to have a smoother bark, whereas it's not going to look fuzzy. This looks fuzzy or looks like old rope. So the grapevine is going to be smoother. Okay. And we're coming up on our first meadow. And we've got a couple interesting things that we will point out up here at the meadow. And a lot of these trees are marked like... Um, I, I just want to mention sassafras. When I was a little girl, we had a sassafras tree behind our house and my brother and sister and I would take off a little branch and then we'd suck on it mm -hmm. and my my mother taught us to do that because it was a she said that they made root beer out of it and mm -hmm. um, I have fond memories of that uh, something I'd like to mention about the sassafras is a lot of people can ID trees by their leaves uh, sassafras has three different types of leaves you can see on this tree, the three-lobed leaf. That's what I remember from my childhood. But it also has a leaf that looks like a mitten. You can see the thumb sticking out to the side. I don't see any old leaves from last year. Yeah. And then there is a, there's a, a third type of leaf, and it is more like a normal leaf. But yes, people used to, they do, would dig the roots of the sassafras tree and make a drink from it. And that's a huge hairy vine there. 
That almost looks like something from a sci-fi movie. Hmm. Yes. And something else about sassafras, um, people used to, uh, in the spring, brew a tea as a spring tonic. And sassafras, drinking that in the spring, was supposed to um, thin your blood after the winter and uh, give you more energy. Mm -hmm. And to this day, you can even buy a sassafras concentrate in some stores and make your own sassafras tea. Now, bats, uh, they're pollinators, right, Cheryl? Uh, they they uh, sure are, especially in the tropics. Um, something else that was an Eagle Scout project that you can see here is our bluebird trail. We have a very nice set of uh, bluebird houses on poles here. And uh, one of the things that's important about uh, bluebirds, just like we were talking about bats, loss of habitat, bluebirds used to, they're cavity nesters. So they used to nest in um, cavities and old fence posts. Well, people don't use wooden fence posts anymore. They use metal ones. And so the bluebirds have lost their nesting um, area. So you can build bluebird boxes and put them up and help the bluebirds out. And that has really helped the bluebird population. There for a while it was in serious decline, but now it's back up because people have built bluebird houses and put them up. And so we've got a very nice bluebird he trail here along the fence line. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a gardener too and uh, also a naturalist, so I'm very aware of invasive species. And one of the worst ones we have around here, and it is all in these woods and you see it in people's yards, is this right here. This is an Asian privet. Um, it blooms in the spring, uh, and for people who have allergies, it can make you miserable. I'm highly allergic to it and I've been suffering for for the last month or so. But if you find this in your yard, please pull it up. It, it'll come up, come up very easily if you catch it when it's young. Well, I've got it all, I, never, I think every one of my flower beds and I guess I missed some of them because I can't pull them out. I've had to cut them. I've tried digging them. So that's good to know, but sometimes I wouldn't know if it's green. I think it's something that's supposed to be there. And then it's, it, yeah, has, it's, it has a very distinctive look. It's uh, sneaky. It also has black berries on it after sometime after it blooms. And the reason it has spread so much is the birds will eat those berries and the seeds will pass through their digestive system. And wherever they fly over, they're planting that seed. So you can have privet everywhere. Uh, it's so invasive. Uh, the Lichterman Nature Center actually has a privet pool every spring. Uh, there's no way you can get rid of all of it, but if you can help keep it under control to keep it from uh, crowding out our native shrubs and trees. Actually, it was brought over, I believe it was in the 1850s, actually as a landscape plant. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of the uh, invasive plants that we have came from Asia. Apparently, we have similar climates and they love it over here. And so when they escape cultivation, they can, they can crowd out all of our native uh, plants. So if you have it in your yard, I encourage you to pull it up. It's very easy to spot when it's blooming because it has, it has a very, very sweet, almost sickeningly sweet scent. And if you have allergies, you'll know it if there's one blooming close to you because uh, it will um, it will make you miserable. Listening to the birds. Those are northern cardinals and they're talking to each other. You can hear one in the distance. That one in the distance, that's a cardinal talking to one of the cardinals up here. Now, is that a mated pair, do you think? Or is that just... No, that's probably just... Um, villagers talking to each other right because right now they've been nesting and mated pairs will stay close to each other up at the front of the museum where we have the feeding station 
I've been watching them and you'll see we have a, a, a pair who have apparently made a nest in, in one of the plants up on the hill and they come back and forth to the feeders, the pair. So they you all, uh, they'll stay together. But now we have a lot of cardinals here, so they're just conversing with each other. All right, we stopped here at these trees and you, you can see the, the holes in the base of the tree. And uh, to a lot of people, that would not be a good thing. But out here on the nature tra trail, that is wonderful because that's a home for somebody. It could be a raccoon, it could be a possum, um, it could be all types of, uh, of critters. But uh, that is a great place for them uh, to, to get in, uh, to shelter out of the weather, uh, to hibernate in in the wintertime. And we have a lot of these. We have one down at the beginning of the trail that I always called the fairy tree because it looks like something that a fairy would live in. But this is what I was talking about when I said if you if you happen to have a snag on your property that you could leave safely, it's wonderful because you'll also have woodpeckers will excavate a cavity and live in there. Uh, we have several different species of woodpeckers around here, and so uh, they love dead trees. Have another another one of those colonies of May apple. Some people call it the umbrella plant because when it first starts to emerge before it completely opens up, it kind of looks like a, an umbrella that's closed. It, the uh, it's it's kind of a little bit twisted. And these May apple, the you see the little yellow specks, that is actually a rust disease that they have. It doesn't really harm the plant, but that is just something that gets on it. There's another American beech that uh, was carved into. Thankfully, it's healing over and it, it doesn't seem to be suffering too much. Another great thing about this nature trail, especially with, well, uh, all the stress and quarantining we've had to do recently. Uh, sometimes you just need to get away and have, have some time to yourself. This is a perfect place to do it. Uh, coming out into nature, feeling the sun on your face, the breeze on your cheek, and listening to the birds. I don't know about you, but it really, really calms me down. And uh, the thing about uh, nature during this whole pandemic, nature's kept on going. Uh, one of my things that I've learned in research, uh, um, other artists and writers looking for inspiration. Um, and a lot of them, one of the first things they say is they spend time in nature. And Claude Monet did that. Um, he would spend hours and all day long in nature and then he would actually paint outdoors as well um, different scenarios and everything and, and yeah nature is good for the soul it really is absolutely and the great thing about this place is you don't have to go far to reach it it's in the middle of town and so yeah, it's it so free. convenient it's free yeah yes thank you Sherry. now um I wanted to mention, I wanted to talk to you about shoes. Um, Cheryl, you've got on actual hiking boots. I do not. I've got on like athletic, you know, running shoes or whatever. But I know, especially after rain and um, parts of the trail are slippery. You've got these um, gumball things, which you've got in your hand. I see moss there, little pebbles. Um, and so I just wanted to have you talk about safety as far as sure footing and what you should wear on your feet um, you want to wear a good pair of shoes that has gripping power these are actually hiking shoes so they have plenty of of grooves in them so that i can uh, grip the ground mine do too especially after a rain and you know we're having a lot of showers lately 
uh, you want to be mindful when you're out on the trail and even on the bridges they can be uh, slick especially if where you have moss the moss is beautiful but it's slick so you want to be careful when you're out on the trail enjoy nature but be careful being a budding artist uh i have a different eye for things out in nature now and as cherry pointed out the cool moss on that tree and i just see uh all types of designs uh, i can't hardly wait to maybe get home and sketch it out tonight and uh try to id that tree i'm not sure which one that is yeah, and i know we haven't talked about this but you know your cell phones nowadays they all have beautiful cameras and so that's something that you can do when you're out on the nature trail is take reference photos and show I will be happy to text this to you. Thank you. And uh, the cameras on these nowadays are awesome and you can edit on these and um, they're just something you should definitely take along with you when you're out on the nature trail. And something else I haven't mentioned, but that made me think when Barry was taking the photo, there are lots of free apps out there for plant identification, insect identification. One that I highly recommend that's free, it's called iNaturalist. You can take a photo of something that you want to ID, punch that information in, go to the website, and we'll, it will give you a list of, it will be, you know, one of these 10 things. I've used it to ID snakes, I've used it to ID birds, and I've used it to ID plants. So go to your app store, it's free, it's wonderful, it's great to use.